In this podcast number six, I'll be talking again to Matt Oakley, Director and Head of Commercial Research at Savills. Last time he and I spoke was in June 2017 when we looked at the impact of Brexit. Today we'll be taking a brief look back at 2017, we'll look at the impact of the autumn budget and take a look at the year ahead for 2018. Savills provide advice and analysis to clients in all sectors of the property market, but Matt's focus is on commercial real estate. With 30 years of experience, we're fortunate to be speaking to him again. Matt, good to see you, and thanks very much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure, Paul. Thanks, Matt. When we spoke last June, there was a feeling that non-res ultra-high net worth individuals were almost ring-fenced from the effect of Brexit, since they still viewed the UK as a safe, safe in inverted commas, place to invest their money. And what I mean by safe is you get the red line around your property and there's a government back guarantee at the land registry for that. Um, plus, there are still good yields to be gained. However, in Philip Hammond's budget just over a month ago, we saw changes to the UK property market, particularly taxation. Now, Non-UK resident funds, companies and individuals investing in commercial property in the UK will have to pay tax on gains on increases in value from the 1st of April 2019. Now, Matt, in my eyes, this is a huge news for the commercial property sector for a few reasons. Uh, Mr Hammond is clearly trying to curtail some of the investment from um, overseas and ultra high net worth individuals. So I've really got two questions for you here. If it's not been too soon, given the budget was only end of November, what's been the impact so far, or from what you've heard, the feeling in the market to this change? Inevitably, it's been very mixed. You know, it's probably worth clarifying that there is still a consultation exercise here, and the consultation is around who will be exempt. Because the, the idea of Mr. Hammond is, is for it to be a level playing field for non-domestic investors to be treated the same as domestic. So, for example, domestic REITs don't have the same CGT liabilities as domestic institutions. So it would be maybe unfair to apply this to uh, foreign REITs. He said in the statement, sort of in the papers, that you know foreign pension funds were definitely going to be excluded from this. And I think there's going to be a lot of lobbying over the next five or six months for other, from other groups who should say, well, we should be exempt from this. The client response, again, has been mixed. I think some have definitely used it as a reason to sort of chip pricing, a handful that is. Others, I think, have just sort of rather wearily nodded their heads and said, well, yes, it's probably right that we should be treated fairly on a level playing field with domestic investors, and that's how we're treated pretty much in the whole of the rest of the world. My big worry in the run-up to the budget was that he was going to go further and bringing in an extra tax for non-domestic investors, uh, like what happens in the US. One thing I want to pick up on what you were talking about there was the REITs. How do you think this will affect the market moving forward? Do you think we'll see restructuring in new trends or what do you think the impact will be? I think someone will be disadvantaged. You know, some group of investors, and if I was a betting man, I would say it would be the non-domestic private investor. They're not going to be exempted from this. This is an extra tax they will have to pay that they haven't paid in the past. That has to affect perhaps not necessarily their desire to invest in the UK, but the price they're prepared to pay. So I think in the back of their mind, they're going to have this view that when I come to sell it, I'm not going to make quite as much money, therefore maybe I shouldn't pay so much. So I think it will affect pricing. I think for the institutional investors, it will just be something that they, they build into their appraisals. And again, it will depend on the point that you made about the sort of the comparative story between the UK and other places they can invest in. In the grand scheme of things, it didn't really affect the market at all last year. So you know, the UK didn't quite have a record year, but it was a lot better than expected. So it was about 65 billion invested in the UK last year, commercial of which 40% was non-domestic. In London, it was about 19, of which 80% was non-domestic. In both cases, those were the sort of the second best years ever. And I suspect when we when we met, you know, last time round, there was no way I was predicting that the market was going to be that strong. 
international investors have been hugely important and we think are going to continue to be and we think there are going to be some new groups coming in as well particularly european institutions so just picking up on a couple of things you said there firstly last year was the second best ever is that right yeah last year the second best and at the same time you said that you think moving forwards these changes will have an impact on pricing you also said you see new trends or new groups coming into the market now Putting all that together, do you think sort of the impact on pricing will be compensated for by new groups coming in and picking up the slack? I think if you're just looking at volume, you know, the volume of money targeted at the UK, I don't see it changing significantly as a result of, of this, this tweak to the CGT relationship. I think what will affect it is, 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 you know, macro trends. So whether, you know, the people perceive the UK as being higher or lower risk than where they're coming from or other domains they could put their money into, whether they see the returns coming off the UK are better or worse. But I do think, you know, the last year was maybe characterised by some vendors, generally British, perhaps seeing some non-domestic groups as the sort of goose that laid the golden egg. There was this perception that you could sell anything to ultra high net worths from Hong Kong. There was this perception that they were relatively unsophisticated investors and they would almost, you know, that you could guarantee there was a record price to be achieved. It was the sort of, you know, the Bitcoin moment for property. The greater fool theory came in. Someone will pay more for this than I paid for it. Therefore, it's a good investment. And I think the realization is just starting to come that these are very seasoned investors generally. They do have a ceiling to pricing and they do have an attitude to risk. And, you know, they're probably not going to go any higher in terms of prices in some markets. So I think some vendors this year greedier vendors will be disappointed right, interesting so in a nutshell you think that prices will probably be impacted by these changes this year although it won't actually impact on the volume of trading done ultimately there'll just probably be some more disappointed vendors which i guess means some happy buyers potentially yes possibly i think there's still going to be a lot of competition for certain types of asset classes as we discussed last time we met i just think anyone who is betting that prices in the uk are just going to continue to rise and rise and rise on the back of strong global demand for the uk is probably slightly delusional was there anything else in the budget that caught your eye before we move on to taking a quick look back at 17 and the markets that you were just talking about Funnily enough, no, I almost never look at the budget. There's this sort of slavish <laughs> rush you know, to comment on it, and there's very seldom anything on commercial property in it. I did have this sneaking worry that there was going to be something about the tax environment, and, and that came true, and it definitely wasn't as bad as I hoped. The other thing, not in the vein of the budget, you know, certainly that we were keeping an eye on was the London plan in terms of uh, the mayor's new sort of guidance for the London planning system. And we definitely were a little worried there may be some more detailed guidance on affordable office space going forward. But luckily that didn't come to fruition. But the budget seldom excites me on the commercial property side. The rest of us are sort of waiting with bated breath to see what comes out. But, um, but anyway... Moving on, taking a quick look back at 2017, and if you take a look at the results from a broad spectrum from 2017 coming into the new year, I'm looking, talking about different sources here, the Lenders Index, yourself, Savills, other large surveyors, the commercial property market didn't drop off a cliff as was potentially feared um, in the sort of the 12 months after Brexit. Some property markets obviously did better than others, Taking a look back, could you just give us a snapshot of some of the areas which did better, some which underperformed, and indeed, did any drop off a cliff which wasn't obvious? I think you know, you've hit, hit the nail on the head there, Paul. I think we were too negative coming into the beginning of 2017 about a whole range of factors. And I think in, in the real estate space, that was probably too negative about how London-based businesses, particularly financial services, might react to impending Brexit. And I think we were also too negative about how international investors might react to impending Brexit. I think we sat here and said, you know, London's expensive, passporting et al. A Brexit means that businesses are going to be averse to making decisions, therefore leasing activity and investment activity is probably going to be down. And, and both 
were proven to be wrong. Uh, what we forgot was that the UK still looks comparatively cheap and comparatively low risk compared to many of these domains around the world. I think that's true. Looking specifically at the types of property we have, something I actually found particularly interesting was last June, when we last spoke, you predicted that the industrial space was going to become more popular. You thought it was a good asset class. If we dig down a little bit deeper, asset classes now, can you give us a snapshot of which ones performed well, not so well? Mm. Sure. Offices did decline in popularity. So if you look at sort of where investors were putting their money prior to the referendum and post it, offices have definitely decreased in popularity. And I think that was a reflection of people over panicking about London. And I think with leasing activity actually very strong last year, that's probably a non-story. One of the surprises, the biggest surprises, was on the retail side. And one of the segments that we saw an increase in investor activity was just just sort of high street shop market. And it's difficult to explain because generally institutional investors still seem to hate retail. I think that was a reflection of investors coming out of private investors coming out of the private rental sector, residential rental sector, because that's got a lot more challenging to make a decent return. And it probably seemed easier to buy your local Costa Coffee or Starbucks at the, the auction. I think that market has been surprisingly strong. The one that hasn't been a surprise at all is industrial. I've seen as safe, secure, and has been incredibly popular as an asset class. However, the occupational story last year wasn't as strong as the year before. The year before 2016, we saw record levels of occupational demand in, in the industrial sector. Last year was just average. The supply story isn't quite as persuasive. So I think while institutional investors and private investors are really into industrial it may not be the ubiquitous buy that it was 12 months ago great that's that was fascinating I th and i particularly like the fact that the industrial space did well and that's what you you sort of read the tea leaves for and on that note looking forward to 2018 we're in january i'm seeing as you did so well with your your comments last june what other trends do you predict moving forward bearing in mind what we've talked about and generally in the property market i think all property sort of investment development decisions are going to be phrased against the background of brexit for some years to come and those who are pessimistic will continue to be pessimistic however hard one tries to convince them but I think there is an increasing realization that the process is long. There is probably a hard end date, which is the next general election, but that does give you a window to be a bit more adventurous. So generally, I think we will see a little bit more value add investing this year than we did last year and the year before. People saying I can maybe do a refurbishment and get it to the market and let it before Brexit hits and the world changes fundamentally. I think the bulk of investment interest is still going to be risk averse. Um, I think industrials will continue to do well, London industrials in particular, because that's what people want to buy. It's safe and secure. I think elements of the retail market, you know, prime London, prime Edinburgh will continue to be popular. And I think, you know, very well let office buildings will continue to be popular and all those lovely alternative sectors that are heavy income focused like data centers and student housing, they'll be popular. But for me, the, the opportunities I think are, are maybe going a bit against the herd. It's being a bit opportunistic. It's being a bit value add and it's saying against a world of, of people chasing security, I've maybe got a window to do something a bit more creative because some of that stuff is priced quite attractively. For shopping centres are a really good example. Probably had their worst ever year in terms of investment volumes in the UK last year. We've had a couple of mega mergers, obviously with Westfield and Into, and you know, merging with, with the different parties. There's gonna be some fallout from that. There's gonna be some fallout from the American opportunity funds who own a lot of UK retail, and they just don't like retail generally, regardless of whether it's in the UK. So there'll be some more stock in the market this year. It will be priced quite affordably, I think. Um, and amongst that lot, there will be some absolute little bargains. So I think the bargain hunters will probably do well in 2018. The main message I was taking from what you just said was that risk aversion is going to play a key factor, given that we're still in this uncertain time from Brexit. And in saying that, retail has obviously been dramatically affected by inflation and 
consumers' habits, the rise of the internet, internet purchasing, which probably is the reason that retail is having such a, a bad time of it of late in, in investment terms. Yes, I think you know retail has been hit twice, really. It's been hit by what you might call the cyclical change and mm. the slowing consumer economy, and it's been hit by the structural change of internet shopping. Yeah, double, double whammy. Well, I find that fascinating, Matt. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us again. You've been listening to Matt Oakley, Director and Head of Commercial Research at Savills, and me, Paul Olaf, Legal Director from law firm Ashford's in this, my listening podcast, number six. If you have any questions or comments, please comment below this or email me at p.olaf at ashford.co.uk. Thank you for listening.